Great. Okay. We've got a good number of participants here. Seven o'clock has arrived. Hello to some friends that have just logged in. Good evening, everyone, and welcome and thank you for joining me, Alistair Cooper, Master of Wine, for my first online webinar. Um, hopefully, this will go out without too many techie glitches. I'm not the, uh, the best with technology, so if there are any problems, hopefully uh, they'll be minor. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in just a minute, but first of all, I want to say the reason we're here is thanks to Wine Trust. So, uh, Wine Trust are an independent online wine retailer, and um, they approached me and asked me to to run this tasting. I was very pleased they did because they're a company that I've um, I've admired. They've been going for about seven years. Um, and what they do is they have a very well managed curated wine list. So um, they are independent, as I am. I will only work with brands that I believe in and trust in, um, and they have a very a, not small, but a well-managed wine list, which is very important, I think, when you have a wine list, not to have too many, um, because you want to focus on the two most important things that, for me, are value um, and quality. Um, and that's one of the core principles that Wine Trust has, is value for money. And I, as a wine expert, really desperately want wine consumers to get value for money, especially now in these tricky times uh, that we're all facing, some of us will be facing, uh, financially. So value for money is one of the core principles. So thank you, Wine Trust. Why did they ask me? Well, why am I qualified to sit here and talk to you um, and have fun with you about wines? Well, I am um, a master of wine. So some of you may wonder what a master of wine is. Um, it sounds very grand. Um, there are currently, I think, less than 400 of those masters of wines in the world. Um, it has a notoriously low pass rate. It's generally accepted to be the, um, the highest, uh, the pinnacle of wine education and wine knowledge in the world. So I feel very honored to have got there. It took me five years of blood, sweat, toil, uh, a lot of wine tasting and traveling to wine regions, which I've got to say I did enjoy. Um, so, but there was a lot of work along the way. Um, and I'm very pleased now to be able to use those two letters MW after my name. So what does it allow me to do? I'm very lucky, I do various things with my, <coughs> with my working life. I'm a wine writer, I'm a wine journalist, I work for JancisRobinson.com, um, I work for Decanter Magazine and various other publications. I'm lucky normally to travel the world to lots of beautiful wine regions to judge, to consult and to do lots of fun things. I should actually be in Chile right now uh, consulting, um, but with the coronavirus, I'm currently here. Instead, every cloud has a silver lining. I get to be here with you this evening, tasting some wonderful wine. So hopefully we're gonna have a fun tasting together. So tonight we have a tasting of six wines that I've put together, and there's a pretty good theme behind the wine. So I'm doing six wines from six countries. Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of a world tour, and I've chosen them for several reasons. Firstly, value for money. Secondly, um, because I think they offer wines that we should be drinking now at springtime. Um, I always get asked as a wine, when people work out, I'm in the wine industry, what's my favorite wine? I've got to say, it's a, wine, it's a question I dislike because I don't know what they mean. Do they mean a great variety? Do they mean a region? Do they mean a chateau? Um, and for me, the greatest wines that I've had are not the most expensive, but they depend on where I am, who I'm with, um, and wines can evoke so many memories of places, smells that take you to places and places you've been and the best wines are shared with people and the environment you're with. So we've all been locked in these four walls for a long time. So let's see if we can travel the world and I can transport you and these wines can transport you somewhere else. So I've chosen wines that are important to me. So let's get cracking. You're probably thirsty now um, with the first wine that we're tasting. So. Hopefully, most of you have got the wines along with you. Um, if you haven't, don't worry, have a glass of anything, and you can get the wines uh, from winetrust100.co.uk forward slash lockdown hyphen tasting, but I'll tell you again at the end where you can order these wines. So first of all, and also I want you to ask questions if you can, but I, if you type them in the chat bar, in the webinar bar, I will go through the wines, the six wines, and then at the end, Hopefully, well, we will have time for a few questions. So we'll do them at the end rather than with each wine. So without any further ado, pour yourself 
uh, a decent slug of this first wine, the Amalaya Torrentes Riesling blend from Argentina. Now, Argentina is a country that's very dear. I'm going to have a swig as well, or just a smell. Gorgeous. Argentina is a country that's very dear to my own heart. I was lucky to live there for um, several years. Uh, my eldest daughter was born in Argentina, so it's a country that means a lot to me. Um, and when you hear about Argentina and wine, I'm pretty sure all of you will be thinking about Malbec. Um, and rightly so. Malbec is a wonderful grape that's done incredibly well in Argentina, bit of a phenomenon and it branded itself. However, and we probably don't even think about white grape varieties with, with Argentina, yet I think Torrentes, this great variety, is an unsung hero of Argentina. And that's why I wanted to show it to you today to show you exactly what I mean. Um, so this comes from the northern part of Argentina. Please taste along while I'm tasting, while I'm talking, and I'll tell you my taste in a, in a minute. Um, from the northern part of Argentina, from vineyards that are in the desert of Salta. Um, and how do they produce wines in the desert? They produce them there because there's also a mountain range. And these wines are produced at extremely high altitudes. In fact, the winery that owns Amalaya called um, Colomé, they have vineyards at 3,600 meters above sea level, which is astonishingly high. They are the highest commercial vineyards in the world. Um, these grapes that come from for, for this torrent test actually are not from that high. They're from uh, about 16 to 1,700 meters above sea level, which is still pretty high. I think of most European ski resorts are around 16 to 1,800, so still extremely high vineyards. Um, and what is it I love about torrent test? I'm going to have a smell. It's one of the very few grapes uh, when made into wine that actually smells grapey. And that sounds like a funny thing to say, but not many wines smell grapey. This does. So the parent grape of this, without being too geeky, is a grape called Muscat, which is highly aromatic. So I think aromatic is the word that we tend to think of with Torrentes. Now, if there's one thing that Torrentes is missing, it can be a little bit of acidity, and I think that, that wines need to be refreshing. They really need a streak of acidity. So Torrentes can have all that exotic flavour, those floral notes, sometimes even pineapple-y, um, a bit like blossom as well, but it can lack a little bit of freshness on the palate. So the clever team at uh, Amalaya came up with the idea of putting 15% of the grape Riesling in there. And Riesling is a wonderful grape that I urge you to go out and try. It's a German grape variety, but it's grown all over the world. And it is a wonderful, wonderful grape variety. But what Riesling has that Torrentes sometimes doesn't is that bag of acidity that it can add to wine. So when they blend that little bit of Riesling, it's got 15% in, it really lifts the wine. And this is where I like to think of the, the role of the winemaker as being much like a chef. If you go into a kitchen, they can use salt and pepper to spice things up. They can use different cuts of meat. They can cook things for long periods, for slow periods. You can make a casserole, eat it the next day, and the flavours will change. So much as winemakers, chefs can do that, winemakers can also tinker with their wine to create a different flavour profile. So I hope you've all tasted the wine. I have to spit. I'm hoping, drink moderately of course, drink in moderation, but I hope you don't have to spit this evening and I will enjoy a glass later. Exactly as I said on the palate, oodles of freshness, bags of that exotic fruit, and almost I get this sort of tin pineapple character. Um, some of you may laugh at some of the things I say, and we all have different uh, synonyms that we come up with for certain flavors. This reminds me of sitting before we had barbecues in Argentina, and we had a lot of barbecues when I lived there. I was quite a big lad when I lived there, a few stone heavier. Um, and before each uh, meat feast, we always had a glass of Torrentes before to refresh our palate. And it is a great variety that I would love to see over here more. What's more, it's an amazing bargain at only £10.50 per bottle. Um, so I think for value for money, this is an absolute corker and perfect for all the blossom that's coming out this springtime at the moment. So 
We're going to move on to the next one, but before we do, I just want to explain what Amalaya means. Um, it does mean in the Kalchaki, uh, the, the currently extinct Kalchaki um, tribe, um, it means hope of a miracle. Um, and obviously they didn't get the miracle of life, but they live on through Amalaya. So that's our first wine. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I've seen a few questions coming up already. I'll put this one back here before we move on to our second wine. So hopefully you've finished the first one and can move on to the second one. Excellent, we've got someone there saying they love the wine. I do too, and I'm glad to introduce you to this wine. So moving on, that was spring in a glass. Now we're gonna change tact a little bit. Um, someone else is loving this wine, lovely to see. We're gonna go, we're heading over to Italy now. So we're gonna, if you, all of you that have the wines, we have the Suave Superiore Classico from Cantina di Monteforte. I hope that was said with a, with a decent accent. Um, and this comes from the Veneto region. The poor Ven Venetians have had a pretty rough time recently with the coronavirus. Um, we were there actually when the coronavirus hit, um, we were in Venice and it was, um, it was awful to see. So one of the reasons I chose this was that, um, to raise a glass to the, to the folk of Veneto who lost so many people with coronavirus and to um, totally bring a bit of joy to us through them thinking of them. So the region of Veneto is a really interesting one because it actually produces more wine than any other region in Italy. Um, and you'll know why when I say the following types of wine that come from there. So the Veneto is home to Prosecco. Um, or someone's saying I have a perfect accent. Thank you very much. Um, it's the home of Prosecco. It's the home of which I know all of you have drunk at some point. It's also the home of Valpolicella and Suave. And Suave is what we're having now. So all wines that you would have heard of. Italy, just so you know, is a nightmare for learning about wines and grapes because this Suave, I'm sure you've heard of Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Merlot, etc. Over in Italy, they have a host of their own grape varieties. So this Suave is made from a grape called um, uh, Garganiga, which you may may not have heard of. Valpolicella is made from Corvina. Prosecco is made from Glera. So they're all made from their own indigenous grapes. But hopefully you will have heard of Suave. So this is made actually by a cooperative. Please do have a, have a taste. And a cooperative is where a group of wineries or people with vineyards, sorry, not, not wineries, get together and they make it in a local um, cooperative where they all pull their grapes and uh, sometimes with a bit of help from the, the guys that are growing the grapes, they make the wine and sell it together. So it's economies of scale, essentially. So there's 600 growers um, that provide grapes to this particular cooperative. But the wine is actually made by a Kiwi, by a fantastic winemaker called Matt Thompson, who I've been buying and selling and drinking Matt's wines for many, many years. And he really makes some cracking wine. So this wine here I chose because it's the perfect, we've had a really fresh, racy, brisking, brisking um, um, wine from, from Argentina. And now this, I want to have something that's a little bit richer. And when you're tasting wines, you always go up from the lightest to the richest. So this actually, I think, has a really nice halfway house between people that will love really fresh wines and people that will love um, wines that are a little bit richer. So, and I'm gonna give you a tip as well about Suave. I'm gonna have a smell first. Lovely, I think you'll see about that richness and we'll talk about that richness in just a second. Before I forget, the tip for Suave is always look, and I hope you can see with, with the lights in here, for the word superiore or classico. And the same with Valpolicella, because what happened was these wines were becoming really popular in the 1970s. But what happened was that um, they expanded the areas where you can make the wines of Suave to soils that weren't really suited for it. So the demand went up and they said, we need to make more of this stuff. So they moved out to soil types. The best soils in this area are volcanic. And they moved out to non-volcanic soils that weren't 
right or apt for producing quality suave. So if you look for superiore or classico, then it's not guaranteed it's going to be a great wine, but it's more of a guarantee that it um, that it can it it, it can uh, it, it it will be a better wine. I've got some more questions coming up. I'll come to the questions at the end. Um, but one is how long can we keep it in the fridge? I think uh, for how long? Oh, a couple of days, two or three days with this one, no problem. Um, uh, so about a little bit more about the taste of this wine. Hopefully you'll see it's a little bit richer. Several reasons why. This is from the 2017 vintage. It's richer because that was a warmer vintage, but they also used a little bit of oak influence here. And that little bit of oak gives texture. So I'm getting more, more you often get on, on good suave is sort of peaches and stone fruit and something nutty and almondy. And that can be a characteristic actually of a lot of um, Italian white grape varieties. But it's got a little bit of oak. They aged it for eight to 10 months in old oak just to give this wine a little bit more texture. And as I say, we're sort of cranking it up with the wine styles. And you always go from the, from the lightest to the richest. And I've got a real treat for you next. So, again, talking about value for money, this wine's coming in at sub 10 pounds, um, nine pounds 50. It's the 2017, as I said, and it needs drinking pretty soon. Um, so get yourself a case of that and you'll see it goes well on its own or with food. So we're moving on now to our third wine on our round the world tour. So I've given you two amazing value for money wines now before, and now we're cranking it up a bit to a bit of a serious bad boy from New Zealand. So we've got here, for those of you who have got the, the wine in front of you, or we've got some what kind of food. I'll answer some food questions later. Good point. Um, we've got the Grey Wacky, uh, a very wacky name, Sauvignon, Wild Sauvignon from New Zealand, from Marlborough in New Zealand. Now, let's pour ourselves a glass of this. This, um, for those of you that I'm sure actually nearly all of you will be aware of Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc is an incredible success story. So Sauvignon Blanc's home originally was from the heartland of the Loire Valley in France, Sancerre, um, which, I'm, which, which you probably would have heard of. That was the heartland of Sauvignon Blanc, yet undoubtedly now, Sauvignon Blanc's home lies in New Zealand. And it's what a success story. Grapes were only planted in Marlborough in 1976. So in Viner's terms, that's extremely young. So they haven't been making wine there for a long time at all, yet they have gone to the top of the charts. It's all my mum drinks. She only drinks Oyster Bay Sauvignon and other great varieties. She loves Marlborough Sauvignon. Um, and so many people do. And there's a reason why, and it's an understandable reason, the flavors in Marlborough Sauvignon are so very easy to understand. They're normally overtly gooseberry, passion fruit, tropical flavors. Um, and people can understand it and they can recognize it and they know that there's not that much variance um, between New Zealand Sauvignons. They all have that very similar, um, easy to understand and appreciate characteristic. Not this one, however. That's why I chose this. I wanted to show you something totally different. So, this certainly does not smell, I'm sure you'll agree, of um, gooseberries, of passion fruit, of tomato leaf, which New Zealand Sauvignon so often can. No, this is really quite different. So, um, the Cloudy Bay, you may have heard of Cloudy Bay Sauvignon Blanc, which was the cult icon wine of New Zealand. Um, and the gentleman that started that was a chap called Kevin Judd. And Kevin, after 25 years of making Cloudy Bay, so a quarter of a century, behind uh, the helm of this iconic winery, founded Grey Wacky. Why is it called Grey Wacky? It's called Grey Wacky. It's, it's named after the, the, um, the stones, the grey slate stones that they find in the vineyards there. Um, and this is a completely different take. So the wild refers to it's made with wild yeasts. And without getting too techy, one of the things that gives New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc its characteristic is they use a specific type of yeast to exacerbate, there's a lot of other things they do as well, those flavors. 
Most winemakers will add yeast to their fermentation to give flavours, but if you go with natural wild yeasts, you can get very different flavours. Um, so that is what we have here. This is anything um, but gooseberry. In fact, quite the opposite. So what Kevin did here was he fermented it in old oak barrels for 12 to 14 months, which is a long time, with these wild yeasts. And what you get from these, these natural fermentations is complexity of flavour and texture. So for me on the nose, this is far more about um, smoky characters and almost herbal characters, but it's the palate that I find really interesting. As I say, smoky tins, I actually opened this bottle last night and it's changed dramatically overnight. This is a stunning, oh great to see someone's put up there, this is fantastic. This is a fantastic wine. This is a wine, as I said, not about overt fruit flavour, it's about layers of fruit. For me, and again, forgive my wine, my, my super uh, wine geeky comments, but there's mandarin skin in there, there's tea, there's all sorts of textures. There's quite a bite, almost a tannic kind of bite to the wine as well. And that smoky character adds to me a real complexity and it's anything, um, it's just such a far cry. If I was given this wine blind, thank goodness I didn't get this in my Master of Wine exams because it really would have um, confused me massively. But it still has the hallmark, fantastic, zippy Sauvignon Blanc characteristics, which for me makes Sauvignon Blanc as well. So I think Kevin's done a great job here. We're talking a little bit more money. We're talking £23. Um, but this is a wine to think about, to try with different foods. Um, Food-wise, oh, interesting to match this one with food. Um, a slightly richer fish dish, it will probably work. Um, it can handle something creamy. You know, most Sauvignon Blancs I think of going with super fresh characteristics, nothing creamy. This because of that texture, texture. Um, I've got someone saying it smells like dill. Absolutely, I totally agree. It's dill or it's tarragon or it's something. There's, there's a herbal character coming, coming from this wine. Um, so I would go with, I would go with, I mean, fish or chicken sounds a bit dull, um, but, but with a fish dish with something a little bit richer, it can handle some cream. Some Dover sole would be nice with this, um, or even just a richer lobster dish. Even a lobster thermidor would work incredibly well because of the texture of the wine could probably stand up, stand up to it. But um, I hope you've enjoyed this wine as much as I have. I just want to keep smelling this wine and it will change as well. The other thing about wine, as I say, they change overnight, they change in the glass. Um, I often play around, my poor partner finds bottles are half drunk around the house with half of them in a decanter and half of them in glasses and she'll go to drink from one and I'll have a go at her because um, I was waiting to experiment how these wines develop in the glass. It's the perils of being a wine geek. Um, so that is our third wine. Um, and yeah, oh, this, this is a wine that gets me so excited. Toasted, nutty, um, and, and anything but a New Zealand Sauvignon, but still true to its place. So let's go now to our fourth wine, our fourth wine of six. Ugh, here we are. Okay. Now we're going for the ultimate luxury escapism. So we're now going for a rosé. And for those of you that have it, we're going for the Miraval Rosé from Provence. And why is this the luxury, um, the ultimate luxury wine? It's because, as some of you will probably know, this is Brad Pitt and Angelone, Angelina Jolie's wine. Um, now, of course, they have nothing to do with making the wine, but they were very clever when they bought this wine estate back in 2008 nine, first vintage was 2012, um, that they enlisted the help of one of the greatest winemaking families in, in France, indeed in the, in the world, um, the Perrin family from Chateauneuf du Pape behind the Chateau de Beaucastel. This is a family with centuries of knowledge of the region and um, real pedigree and fantastic um, 
can I take a five minute break? Oh, there you can't keep up. Oh, we'll keep going. And then uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, the Perrin family has added so much knowledge to what they're doing there. So Brad and Angelina have put the money in, but really it's the Perrin family that have kept this going. So, Rosé, this is gorgeous. This is absolutely gorgeous. I'm gonna have a sip of this now. This is pure raspberries in a glass. Mm. We talk about wines being able to transport you to, um, to different places. This really, really can. Um, so um, Rosé, I remember Rosé was really quite unfashionable for many years. Um, and I remember actually uh, in about 2000, I took my then girlfriend, I didn't know much about wine. I was about to get into to, to, to wine and I was sort of interested. And I took her to um, a quite posh restaurant, the Manoir of Cat Saison. I didn't have much money, but it was, it was a big treat. I'm, my partner's over here giving me evils at the moment. I promise I'll take you one day, darling. Oh dear. Um, and I remember that, that, that I didn't know what to order. And I wanted something that would go with fish, would go with meat. Um, and, I, and I said to the sommelier, I'd like a rosé, please. And um, he looked at me and there was certainly an element of snobbery behind rosé at that time. Um, that was 2000, fast forward 15 years, the last five years, what a phenomenon we've had with rosé. And it's been a global phenomenon, and rightly so, because when it's done well, it is a wonderful, wonderful wine. Um, Provence, why is Provencal rosé so craved after? People love the colour, and the colour is, it is beautiful. This beautiful light salmon pink. What someone up here saying they love the colour and they don't drink rosé. Yes, it is a wonderful, attractive, lovely, lovely colour. Um, uh, but it's a bit more than that. Why is rosé from Provence so good? So a lot of rosé made in many other places are made as a byproduct of grapes that are grown to produce red wine. So they'll make a red wine, while they're making the red wine, they'll bleed off, they'll take a bit of the juice off and bottle the rosé. What does that mean? It means that they haven't explicitly gone out to make a rosé. They've gone out to make a red wine and the rosé is a byproduct of that red wine. So they've grown it thinking of a red wine. What happens in Provence is 90% of the, the wines that are made are rosé and they're made to be rosé grapes. They're not trying to make red wines, they're going there with the intention of making rosé. Therefore, from a quality point of view, they're already thinking about the, the finished product in a different manner. It's not a byproduct, it is the product that they're making. Um, Provence is a beautiful, beautiful place, and um, I'm, this transports me personally back to where I'm fortunate enough to summer every year. We have a family house down in Provence that we go to, and this just takes me there. And this they talk about wine um, going with the local cuisine, and this is a perfect example. Rosé from Provence goes so well with garlic. Not many wines do, um, but rosé from Provence does. And there's a lot of um, garlic used in the food um, down there. This is vintage 2019, so this is a very fresh vintage. And rosé, um, often most people say rosé should be drunk young. Um, but certain wines, and this one, can age quite well. So I think also part of the reason um, rosé has become popular is because of the colour, it's because of the links to Glamour and Saint-Tropez and the Gulf of Saint-Tropez and the Côte d'Azur. It's quite aspirational. Instagrammers love the colour of it because it's so beautiful with sunsets. Um, so I do understand that. But more importantly, the quality of rosés led by Provence has really upped the game for those around the world to make wines. There's a host of, of, of celebrity wines now. John Bon Jovi has, has got a wine from the Languedoc um, and he's now selling it in the Hamptons. That was his target market. So it's certainly got this aspirational tag to it. But this wine just transports me to my summer holidays on the beach on the veranda with a lovely piece of cheese, with some local food, with a soup de poisson, which they have there. And it goes, as I said, with the garlic, with those croutons on the top, it goes incredibly well. Great varieties here. The typical great varieties we find in the south of France for rosé are Grenache, Sanso, a little bit of Syrah, 
Um, and Roll is another one they have a lot of as well. So Roll is a, is a white grape variety, but the rest are red grapes. But the key grapes here, Grenache, Sanso, and there's a bit of a Morvedra more as well. But what they do here, again, we talked about that winemaker's tools for adding. There's 5% of oak is used here. So most of the, oak, the wine is aged in stainless steel. They want to maintain the freshness, but they use 5% of the wine is aged in oak. So, mm. this is definitely, definitely, oh, putting a big smile on my face. Those raspberry characteristics. The other thing I also get, it reminds me for breakfast in Provence, I will always have some melon, and nectarines. And these are the two flavors that I get from this, that stone fruit, that freshness, and that sort of lovely smell of fresh melon as you cut it in the morning with the raspberry, with the red fruit, what someone say melon, definitely those honeydew melons freshly cut is definitely one of the flavors you get here. Um, now this, this is a little bit of a hike up in price. I think on the Wine Trust website, there's some of the 2017 available for 12 pound. I'm not sure if there is, go on quickly and have a look. Um, but this is the 2019 vintage, so super fresh, and this is £19 a bottle. Provence Rosé, the, the demand is so high that, that you can't really, I wouldn't spend less than 11 12 13 pounds but I would spend, this is absolutely worth every penny. You may think being a celebrity wine, it's not going to stack up, um, but this really, truly does. So... We've had some luxury wines and we've hopefully been to Saint-Tropez, the Gulf of Saint-Tropez. We're gonna move on now. We've got two red wines to finish off with on our global tour. So we'll have the, maybe the screw cap. Often people ask me about screw cap. Do I think they're great? And often that happens. Then you just pop, pop them off. Um, I think they're fantastic. I'm a big advocate for screw caps, um, but that's a conversation for another day. Nothing wrong with screw caps. Screw caps are wonderful. So we're gonna pour this away. We're going now to the Southern Hemisphere. We're going back to the Southern Hemisphere and we're going to Australia. So we're going to the Yarra Valley, which is near Melbourne, about 30 miles, I believe, northeast of Melbourne. Um, so what we have here, I'm just, Pour the glass for the thirsty listener. What we have here is the Giant Steps 2018 Pinot Noir from the Yarra Valley. Um, now, Australia is another country that I urge you to drink more wines from, but not just any wines from Australia. I was lucky enough in 2011 to go on a trip that blew my mind and totally changed my perceptions of Australian wine. I knew they made good wines and I knew they made great quality wines, um, but I didn't know quite how good they were. Sometimes we may think of Australia um, and think of perhaps, um, I love Australians, I consult for an Australian company, I love them. But we may think that there is in some elements of their life with their architecture, not as much culture as we have here because it's a country that's only just over 200 years old. So um, perhaps in certain point, they just don't have the history that we have here in Europe and that's fine. But when it comes to winemaking, despite being a young country, they have incredible wine heritage. In fact, they have grapes there, um, that are, they have vines there, sorry, that are 150, 160 years old, way older than anything we have here in Europe. Now, there may be a few that old, but not many in Europe that are that old for, for various reasons of, of disease um, that wiped out our, uh, our grapes. So they have some incredible genetic vine material in Australia um, and culture and history um, and some of, some of the cuttings from the most famous vineyards in France aren't there anymore. They're now in, in Australia and still producing fantastic wines. I chose Pinot Noir because it's a wonderful grape variety and it's perfect for spring and it's perfect for, for, for many things. Pinot Noir is a tricky grape variety, a very tricky mix of a grape variety to grow. It's quite high maintenance. It's tricky in the vineyard. It's tricky... Um, it's, it has a thin skin, it can rot, it's uh, susceptible to all sorts of diseases. You have to harvest it at exactly the right time. Then you get it into the vineyard, into the winery, sorry, um, and you have to be very careful with your fermentations. Um, so there's all sorts of problems that you have to face with Pinot Noir. So it's actually quite a, um, 
it, it's quite an expensive grape to grow and to get right. Um, therefore, I urge you to spend a little bit more money on your Pinot Noir. Not too much, 15, 16, 17 pounds plus. Um, and this is 18 pounds. Um, and what I love about this is it's a nod to Burgundy, which is where Pinot Noir, its spiritual home is, but it's got its own take on it. So someone's written very cherry. And I'm glad they wrote that because this is absolutely, Pinot Noir can be on the light side and it can be on the dark side. Um, and this is certainly, it sounds like something from Star Wars, but it's, um, it's, this is on the darker fruit spectrum. When I first, I opened a bottle of this the other day to practice, of course, make sure I, 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 I tasted it. Um, and I definitely got those darker flavours of Pinot Noir. And again today, I've just cracked this bottle, as you've heard, and it's certainly that darker fruit spectrum. But it has such wonderful freshness and soft softness to the tannins, yet with, for me, and again, as I said before, the freshness and the acidity are just so fundamental for keeping wines interesting and engaging and lively on your palate. This is certainly a wine for those of you that have got it open. Do a geeky me. Pour a glass of it, pour it into a decanter and see how this wine opens up. I came back to it the next day uh, and saw quite how well it had evolved. And it got some more of those um, secondary flavours as we call them. So something slightly earthy or damp earthy or tobacco-y or mushroomy that developed with a little bit of oxygen. This is still a very young wine. This wine as well was the Pinot Noir. I went to Giant Steps Vineyard in 2011, and that's why I chose it, because it was one of the wineries that really showed me and opened my eyes to the potential of Pinot Noir in the upper Yarra, Yarra Valley, which is a cold climate region. It's cooler there than it is in Bordeaux. So you may think of Australia as being this, uh, this raging inferno of a country, and sadly, it, as we all know from the forest fires, it was and it does have problems with heat and with drought. But there are certain pockets of Australia, and the Yarra is one of them, where it is a cool climate region. It's classified as cool climate. It's cooler than Bordeaux, not quite as cool as Burgundy, but cooler than Bordeaux. Plenty of rainfall here, no worries about rainfall in the Yarra Valley. That, that's not a problem that they have there. Um, so I think this is a wine that will open, I know it opens incredibly well over time. Food matches, some of you are asking about food matches. Um, someone said this is a sophisticated wine, totally agree. It's got that elegance and a plushness and a sleekness to the fruit, um, but also with that fresh acidity. So watch this over the night progress and hopefully you'll see what, what I think. Food wise, match wise, duck. Duck. This and duck will be beautiful. Duck with a cherry sauce. You've got the, the fattiness of the duck skin, but the duck itself is quite lean. This will go perfectly well with that. It also goes very well with, with, with loin lamb fillet because I tried it the other day and actually going back to the Miraval this went exceptionally well with lamb so rosé is not just summer, summertime drinking it can be drunk all year round but we had a glass of that and then followed it with a glass of this and it went incredibly well with a lean piece of lamb acidity can go very well with something that's got a little bit of fat um, to it that acidity breaks down and goes along with the fat um, as well as well as tannins can also uh, be broken down as well so um by by protein so if you have a very tannic wine what i mean by that um a big cabernet sauvignon having a big piece of meat works exceptionally well together so there are certain um someone's had lamb with the mirabelle too excellent glad you enjoyed it um so a little bit of food and wine matching um so we are on to sadly our last wine um but then we'll have time for a little bit of a few questions so we're now going to finish our world tour. I don't want to pour this away. Um, I'm going to pour it back into this glass so I can finish it later. It's just too much of a waste. Um, so to finish our world tour, we're staying in the Southern Hemisphere and we're going to what I believe is the most, um, what's the word? Um, dynamic producer of wines in the world at the moment, and that's South Africa. So we're going now with the wonderfully named Chakalaka 2016 from Spice Roots. Spice Roots is the name of the producer. The wine itself is called Chakalaka. Chakalaka, I looked it up, it says on the back here something, but I looked it up. Chakalaka apparently is the name for um, a, a, a 
stew that they make in the townships there, in the sort of poorer areas, is a South African relish. Exactly, someone said that. I read, I went online and they said that it can be made from baked beans, uh, tomatoes, all sorts of spices, but it's a relish and a sauce with baked beans, thank you, to go with all sorts of food there. And it refers to the, to the Rainbow Nation. But I thought, what a lovely name Chakalaka is. Um, so South Africa, why is it so? Well, first of all, in the wine industry, we talk about old world and new world. Um, what is old world? Old world essentially is Europe. And the new world, people tend to think of as being um, uh, anything outside of there. So we've got Chile, we've got Argentina, we've got California, we've got North America, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. But they've been making wine in South Africa since the 1600s, since 1605, in Chile since 1551. In fact, they were making wine in certain parts of, of Chile before they were making wines in the great areas of Bordeaux called Poyac um, and Santa Steph, where Chateau Lafitte comes from. They have more winemaking history in Chile and South Africa than they do there. So um, this is an old world, this is a new world country, but uh, it's got a nod to the old world. However, the new modern South African wine industry really was only born after apartheid. So it's really quite young, actually, from the 1990s onwards. Um, and it's so dynamic because there's a whole host of young, vibrant winemakers who are rediscovering the past um, and also are very globally savvy. And you may have heard of some of the regions from South Africa. You may have heard of Stellenbosch. You may have heard of Paal. You may have heard of Franschhoek. Wonderful regions. But there's another region that I think has been fundamental in really pushing South Africa forward. And that's an area called Swartland. And that's where this Chakalaka comes from, from an area about 40 miles north east of Cape Town. Um, and one of the key things with, in, when you're looking at the wines from, from the Cape is the influence of the sea. So obviously the sea breeze coming in can have quite a, um, a large effect on the ripening of the grapes. Here we're inland away from the influence of any coastal um, uh, breezes. And that means it's a hot, area with very little uh, irrigation and the grape varieties there are the same ones we had actually in the south of France in Provence so they're Syrah, another one called Carignan that you find down there, Grenache, Morveg, great, great varieties that do very well in hot climates and that's why it does so well there. So this actually was made by the guy, a gentleman called Charles Back who owns Spice Root who in 1998 went to the Swartland and saw these old vineyards and they were only making bulk wine then. And he said, wow, this is a, this is a fascinating area. And he put a lot of money and time in promoting this area. And now some of the greatest wines come from there. No irrigation, so the bush vines, they're called bush vines. If you go there, these old gnarled vines that look beautiful. That's chakalakin, I like that, someone said that to me. And this again, spicy as we're all saying, Yes, absolutely. Spicy like chakalaka. Um, it's a spicy blend. And again, we talked about winemaking tools. This, despite the, the spicy depth of the wine, still has acidity. And that's because they add, I think, 10, 13% of a grape called Carignan. And you add a little dollop of that, much as they did with the Riesling here in Argentina, it can really lift the wine. So we're saying chakalaka, we're saying spice. That's exactly what I'm getting. Dark fruit flavors, licorice cherry, plums, spice, something Christmas cakey, but also there's a little bit of oak and cedary wood there. They do use a little bit of oak to age this wine. Mm. For those that have been to the Cape, you may have smelt something called Fimbos in the morning uh, as you go around the Cape. It's a scrub that grows there, much like you have Garrigue in the south of France. And in the morning, it gives off a wonderful peppery, spicy smell. And this really reminded me of the thin moss that you get around Table Mountain. And I think they also have it in the Swartland. It's a really lovely spice that you feel in the morning. Um, and as well, someone's written chocolate. Yeah, could it go with the chocolate? Yes, you could easily pair this with the chocolate. But what I would say, springtime, get your barbecue out. This with barbecue, lamb barbecued meat, anything smoky, everyone saying spicy, saying smoky. You know, think of a, a steak with a, with a spicy rub on it. Um, this will go incredibly well. Tannins are very smooth, it's very soft, um, but there's plenty of acidity there to keep it interesting. 
So 45 minutes in, that was our, our last wine, the Spice Root Chakalaka. Again, there's lots of nice things with, with names of wines. We've had Suave, which sounds like something James Bond would drink. We've had Amalaya, the, the Miracle. We've had the Chakalaka, which everyone's saying is, is wonderfully spicy. Um, we've now got a few minutes um, for a few questions. So I've seen some questions coming up, but if any of anyone's got any questions about anything to do with wine, you know, whack them in the, in, in the web bar now, and I've got five minutes or so to uh, do that before we all have to go out and clap for the NHS at eight o'clock this evening. Um, and while, let's have a look through some questions that we've had here. Um, okay, so we have, what Argentinian reds from Joanna Rossiter, uh, what Argentinian reds would you recommend? Well, um, as I said, you know, Malbec is a great variety, Malbec. Um, uh, there's all sorts of producers that you could be, that you could be looking at. Um, I know that the, these guys also produce an, an amazing wine um, from Altitude. It's about 150 pounds a bottle, uh, and that's their one from three and a half thousand meters above sea level. Um, all sorts of producers in, uh, in Mendoza, one called Altos Las Omigas, who are producing fantastic wines. As I talked about, altitude is a really important part of, of wines in Argentina, and that's all the rage, altitude around Mendoza in the Valle de Uco, um, as well as up north. And those wines from altitude can have huge concentration of flavors due to various there's various reasons why, due to temperature variations, but also the soils they have and also the UV rays can make a big difference. So um, we are also working at, so how long, should we keep it in the fridge before drinking? If yes, for how long? Do you know what? That's a really, really great question because for me, the temperature of a wine is so important. In this country, uh, we drink our whites too cold and we drink our reds too warm. My father still puts his, his, his red near the, near the agar or near the oven to warm up before he drinks it, and, and I can't understand that. Well, I do, you know, with, I don't want to be wine snobby. There is, if you like something in a certain way, please do that. However, I think to maximize your enjoyment, white wines we should take out of the fridge um, 20 minutes before. Our fridges are around five degrees, I believe, and it should be really at about eight to ten so bring it out 20 minutes before and you'll enjoy the flavors much much more um, and red wines um, do you know what in the summer i stick nearly all of my red wines are at room temperature for, for 15 minutes in the fridge just to come down to the right temperature cellar temperature 14 15 degrees is what i'd be saying how do you know which wines to drink young and which we can leave for a few years yeah so that's a great question i think you might know the answer to this one already it's tricky it's not easy to know um, you need to understand maybe um, the producer, the grape varieties. Um, you need to understand, um, you know, certain, certain Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough, as I said, normally, not this one, are wines that you, you would drink young. Um, do, do a little bit of reading. Not all wines age exceptionally well, some, some do. Um, extraordinary wine. So I think it looks like people really hugely enjoyed the, um, the Grey Wacky Wild Sonia, and I'm pleased they did, because I thought actually that might be the most controversial wine because it's not what people were expecting. Um, but I'm glad that, that that seemed to go down very well. More questions. Um, let's see, we've got a few coming. Are UK wines becoming more popular? Uh, what wines from the UK would you recommend? That's a great question. Yes, UK wines, um, are be English sparkling wines specifically are becoming more popular, more people are making them, more people are drinking them. The quality um, has increased dramatically over the past few years. Um, we are one of the, 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 the countries that are actually benefiting from, from climate change, um, if, you can, if you can see it in those ways. So it's getting warmer champagne, it's harder for them to make, it's going to get harder in champagne to make the same quality of wines. Um, and we're benefiting here, certainly in the south of England, from great soils um, and possibilities and warm climate to, to make greater wine. So, yes, they are, um, they are, they are in increasing in popularity. Which ones from the UK would I recommend? Um, there's a fantastic producer called Gusbourne uh, from down in Kent. There's another one um, called Nightingale, who is the most famous one probably. Um, a, a winemaker I know who I like very much is a chap called Dermot Sugru, who makes a wine called Sugru Pierre or Whiston Estate. I live here in Hendy. There's a fantastic one in Marlow called Harrow and Hope, 
run by Henry Lathwaite of, um, of, of the Lathwaite family of, of Sunday Times Wine Club, Direct Wines. Um, you know, he's making fantastic wines. Um, so, yeah, they're not cheap. You know, you're looking at the same price as champagne, but we need to support the English wine industry, especially now. Love the Amalaya. What would you pair it with? Um, what would I pair the Amalaya with? Thai food springs to mind. It's got that exotic spiciness. Um, you know, so we had that uh, um, florality that you can get from lemongrass and some of the spices that they use there. Um, and it's got lots of acidity. But one thing with Thai food that you do need to be a bit careful of is actually they use quite a lot of sugar, of palm sugar in their food. And you need to choose your dish quite carefully. So um, a green curry would probably work with a pad thai. I would say it wouldn't. But a lot of their seafood curries, it would work with. Um, something with a little bit less of the, of, of the palm sugar in. That would be probably what I would think of. Someone thinks Gus Ball is awesome as well. Good, Damien. That's good. Um, chakalaka would go well with cheese. I think it would. Um, lamb. Someone else had supper. Yeah, lamb with the Mirabelle. Um, okay. I think there we have said we go on for, for 45 minutes. We've gone on for 15 minutes. Um, and I hope you've all enjoyed this um, as much as I have. Uh, have thank you for signing in. And of course, thank you to Wine Trust for putting on this event and for asking me to, to host this. I've really enjoyed it. Now, for those of you um, who have got the wines, you know where to go. winetrust.100.co.uk forward slash hyphen lockdown tasting, I think. But if you go to the, to the website, the winetrust100.co.uk website, you will, find, um, you will find these wines and you will find a host of other different wines as well for you to try. Um, so please do log on there and you can always watch this video. This video is going to be available, I believe, to be watched again. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. And at um, eight o'clock, I hope you'll all as well join me in saying thank you to the NHS who are doing an amazing job at this time to support us all um, and, and keep us going and who have brought us together this evening. You know, we, we, we wouldn't be here without them. I'm here, I, I believe I, 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 I suffered from, from coronavirus and, and I, I came out very well. And thank you to the NHS. Um, and every, every silver cloud, as I said, every cloud has a silver lining, sorry, because um, I'm here with you and we're finding different ways to enjoy wine and to transport ourselves around the world. So crack open another glass. And thank you very much and hope to see you again very soon. Thanks, guys.